everyone. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see all of you, wonderful <coughs> to see a packed room. I'm Dan kurtz and I'm the editor of Foreign Affairs Magazine in New hmm. York. Uh, we've got a big and important topic, the future of democracy, and a lineup that needs very, very minimal introductions. So given that, I will dispense with all that quickly and we will get right into the discussion. Uh, I'll start with uh, the person closest to me. We have Egils Levitz, the president of Latvia, a position he has held since 2019. And before that, uh, which is perhaps relevant to this discussion, he was a judge uh, on the European Court of Justice. We then have Minister Sherry Raymond, pa Pakistan's federal minister for climate change, and also perhaps relevant to this discussion, a former longtime journalist, I think spent about 20 years as a journalist. Then Chris Coons, a US senator from the state of Delaware, and I think fair to say one of the uh, US Senate's most prominent voices on global issues, along with lots of um, areas of domestic focus in which he plays a prominent role. And then Tim Snyder, historian at Yale, uh, author of a slew of great books, including most recently, The Road to Unfreedom. Do I have that right? Is that, that the most recent book? Close, okay. Uh, you write a lot of books, so I, I apologize for having the order wrong. Um, and I think fair to say, in Tim's case, in a fairly small category of people who are both uh, truly top flight academics, but also very prominent public intellectuals. So a great mix um, for this topic today. We're having this discussion at a moment when, on the one hand, we're well into the second decade of what the scholar Larry Diamond has called the Democratic Recession. Uh, Freedom House, in its most recent Freedom in the World report, noted that for 15 straight years, more countries have seen democracy decay, have seen deteriorations in democracy than have seen progress. So for every year, for 15 years, more countries have gone in the wrong direction than the right direction. And I think it's fair to say, certainly in the case of my own country, but also when it comes to many other advanced democracies, there's a real profound sense of democratic dysfunction uh, to the extent that uh, some of the, the core tenets of our democracy are at risk. Um, at the same time, I think these past few months have caused at least some people to have a little bit of a sense of, of renewed urgency and optimism around the cause of global democracy. Um, there's a sense of uh, uh, perhaps cautious optimism that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has uh, focused minds around the problem and given a little bit more um, impetus to do something about it. Uh, there's certainly been uh, uh, surprising vigor to the response from many of the global democracies responding to that invasion. And I noted in the, the trust barometer that Edelman released uh, here in Davos this morning uh, that they register an increase in trust in democratic institutions, which has not been true for the past several years, um, which is you know, perhaps a, a reflection of the ways in which Russia's brutality and ineptitude in this invasion has thrown some of the strength of those institutions into stark relief. So it's a, a, a mixed picture, but I would say the broader context is not, uh, not very cheery. But before we get to the, the question of the future of where, where these things go from here, I actually want to ask each of our panelists to uh, spend about a minute reflecting on how we've got to this point. If you look at um, this, uh, uh, the democratic recession these past, past 15 years, the sense of democratic decay, I'd like each of you to give us one minute on what explains the problem to you. And I realize we'll be painting with a very broad brush, but what are the failures of democracy over these past 15 years that account for where we are? President Levitz, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I think there are three main failures of uh, the liberal democracy in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, there are uh, ignorance of the social problems caused by globalization. Uh, there was also ignorance or, or mis uh, misperception on, uh, or mismanagement of uh, the crisis of migra migration and uh, of the crisis of uh, cultural diversity. And there also the third very important um, uh, reason, uh, we have now, uh, since uh, the new social networks, a new kind of formation of public opinion. This is not more the classical one. Uh, the, the democracy is based on the classical uh, ways how the public op opinion is, 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 is formed. And now we have no real answer to this new way of the formation of public uh, opinion. And it, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it shows that this public op the way how the public opinion is, is formed, which is important or decisive for democracy, is easily to manipulate. And this is uh, also a new situation. And we have no real answer to that. Uh, I will mention only uh, that uh, the European Union has uh, adopted a draft, a so-called um, Digital Service Act, 
where is some possibility, uh, then responsibility of the big uh, social platforms provided for. We will see how it works. But it's uh, also in the last moment we should regulate also this issue. And this all uh, is a basis for populism. And I see that the populism is a real danger and a real enemy of the democracy because the populism offers uh, wrong answers to the right problems, especially, uh, especially um, uh, the populism is trying to, to destroy the democratic institutions uh, as uh, courts and uh, rule of law, but also the free press and so on and so on. And democracy cannot live without these democratic institutions. And I think uh, we should uh, find the right answer also to, to the populism. This is only a diagnosis. There is no answer how to deal with that, yeah. but then maybe we can discuss this further, how to deal with that. We will get to the answers. Uh, let's do diagnosis first. Minister yeah. Rahman. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think part of the, again, I also see three problems, uh, but one of them is the structure of even our conversation today, which is sound bites. Uh, and that's, that defines our level and structure of discourse also on the social media, on, on television, even in my country, everywhere. So there's a cognitive disconnect with real structural debates, with thinking as it used to be, with the entire intellectual enterprise on which liberal democracy was based. So uh, people want theater now. They want bread and circus, and they want quick fixes, they want instant gratification, and the populist, picking up from uh, what the president said here, the populist picks that up right there. The wrong answers entirely, the inflammatory, divisive answers to very real issues. The second uh, uh, problem I see here, and, and, and I'm glad we're recognizing that something is very, really broken in, in all our democratic systems, is that um, the, there is little recognition of the the huge inequality that's been growing both in the West, everywhere else, uh, and elites are being obviously targeted as unrelatable, inauthentic, unable to build the trust dividend that democracy gets powered by. So everywhere in the world, and then, and then thirdly, and I'm sure this has been discussed hugely, I'm trying to stick to the limit here, thirdly, uh, there has been a, a growing uh, chasm between the global south, which is not even discussed as the global south anymore, but there it is, and the West, and even in, um, for instance, how the response, the, the, the West's response, or the international system response to the Ukraine crisis or the humanitarian crisis there versus the humanitarian crisis, say, in Afghanistan, or browner cultures, or less colder climates, mm. has been very alienating for those of us who have always taken a clear, uh, uh, linear path, if you like, on, on humanitarian uh, responses. They have to be the same for everyone, is what we grew up learning. Uh, even in Western capitals, where some of us have studied, are privileged enough. So, so these three things have actually created a distance, and and the the core of it is is to my mind, uh, the one percent, which is all of us, telling the rest of the world how to run itself, and not having the empathy to be even relatable. Okay, so we have six hypotheses. We'll see if we can get to, uh, to 12, okay. Senator. Two of mine match with the president. I'll, I'll, I'll simply distill down some great, of great. the ways yeah. in which um, the things uh, my colleagues here have observed are relevant in the United States and then yeah. uh, externally. In the United States, uh, we've long been um, tolerant of high levels of inequality because of a belief in and in actuality of social mobility and opportunity. Yeah. Um, the significant reduction in social mobility in the United States it's a complex word. Are my kids going to do better than I am? Many, many millions of Americans felt like they're on the outside looking in. They're being forgotten. They don't have the same opportunities. First, second, to your point about migration and identity, the United States has made real progress towards acknowledging and addressing um, historic racial and regional and um, uh, historic inequalities and uh, mistreatment of uh, the African-American and indigenous populations of the United States. 
but then by the same token that has produced this sense of a grievance and exclusion and isolation, particularly among those in rural communities and particularly among those in more conservative communities. And these have pulled together in part fueled by social media and in part fueled by uh, domestic migration patterns into a loss of a sense of legitimacy and connectedness to our role in the world and to the possibilities of our nation. 20 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan where broadly speaking exactly those communities that were most likely to have sons and daughters enlist in our military and fight overseas, they concluded that somehow our role in the world was less successful, less legitimate, their future in our country was less bright, and they were fed a story that ultimately really took off, um, that undermined confidence in science, undermined confidence in experts or elites, and ultimately undermined confidence in the legitimacy of the institutions that are critical for our democracy to survive. And then I'm worried that that, um, you know, we're obviously not the sole driver of the world, but when there's something that happens in the United States, like the January 6th assault on our capital, and the world sees it, it shakes confidence or inspires similar activities. And so I think there are ways in which our place in the world um, has also undermined democracies in other places in the world. And we, to heal this or address this, we must look at both. Professor Snyder. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be with all of you and uh, to see friends here. Number one, I think a core problem is the assumption, which has been deeply built into this meeting, among many others during the 21st century, that democracy is somehow a default, that democracy comes automatically, that there is no alternative to democracy, to quote Margaret Thatcher, that, the, that history is over and democracy is all that's left. This thesis, I think, has been, was broadly accepted in the late 20th century and early 21st and never had any kind of basis. That was always, that was always just silliness from the beginning. Democracy requires uh, an understanding historically that it is one possibility among others, that for the 2,500 years that we've had a history of democracy, it has always been, as uh, my compatriot Frederick Douglass put it, it has always been a struggle, and that it must always be based upon values. As we've let the humanities go in the last 30 years, concomitantly, concomitantly with this belief that everything was automatic, concomitantly with this belief that history or larger forces were going to bring democracy, as we've let the humanities go, as we've let history and literature and philosophy go, we've lost the language which allows us to describe why democracy is better. So that's my first point. My second point, I will echo the oligarchy point, which has been made. I'd just like to make it in a slightly different way. For 2,000 years and more, not just left-wing, but conservative voices, Plato to Raymond Aron, have made the point that it's impossible to have a single conversation when there's extreme inequality of wealth. Uh, apart from all the other problems that have been mentioned, we cannot have a single conversation about a society. We cannot have a forum, right? We cannot have a place where people can discuss if they are living completely different lives. And in, when the wealth is controlled, not just by the 1%, really, to which I'll happily raise my hand to, I am in the top 1%, but when it's controlled by the top 1% of the top 1% yes. of the top 1%, yeah. then it's very hard to have a single conversation. My third point is going to be generations. This trust of democracy tends to increase as people get younger, unfortunately. And there's a reason for that, which is that it's very hard when you're young to see a future. And when it's hard to see a future, it's hard to think about how deliberation and all of these slow processes are really what's going to be in your interest. So if we want to have democracy, we have to bring back a future, which means solving the hydrocarbon problem, first of all. It means dealing with climate change, first of all. Thanks. So let's, uh, let's turn to answers for 10 or 15 minutes before we go to the audience. Um, President Levitz, let me start with you. To the extent there is a new sense of urgency around the cause of global democracy in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, what will it take to make good on it? What are the kind of key steps that you see democratic powers needing to take in this moment? And then let me put a, a finer point on one piece of this. Do you find the framing of global dynamics today around democracy versus autocracy as helpful in this regard? Yes. I completely agree with Professor Snyder that we lost the sense that in the history, uh, democracy was established only a short time, maybe 100, 150 years, and only in a part of, of, uh, of the world. 
And this sense was lost. And now, with a Russian invasion uh, in Ukraine, we have now seen that this perception, this very provincial perception, was wrong. And that means we have uh, got more sense for the fragi fragility of the democracy and that the freedom, the democracy, is uh, a very high uh, value which uh, is uh, worth to defend. I think this is an unintended side effect of uh, Putin's invasion to Ukraine. Uh, but I think also that uh, we should keep this moment and uh, to realize that uh, Russia is an aggressive neighbor, aggressive uh, power, and we should defend ourselves. We should help Ukraine, but we should re uh, remind that Ukraine is fighting our fight. And uh, there is a duty of uh, the uh, democratic world uh, to support Ukraine so that, so that uh, Ukraine uh, can win the war. So uh, I see that uh, this moment of self-awareness, which was uh, started, 20, uh, started 24th of February, uh, should be used in a way that we see that democracy is based on values. We have these values, and we have not compromised. We should not compromise these values. And therefore, we should defend our way of life. This is a way of life of democracy. And therefore, I am, would say I am not pes pessimist. I am rather optimist. But in general, I am rea realist. And I see that we should uh, we will uh, take this moment in order to consolidate our democracy, to consolidate the, the international solidarity of all democracies. We, as I said already, that the democracy is, uh, is a state form which is uh, valid only for a minority of the international community. And to make also democracies as a, uh, as a state form more visible in international politics. And therefore, uh, therefore uh, the initiative of President Biden to have a summit for democracy in December last year, I think it is a very good step forward so that we uh, can more value our specific situation, our specific values, our uh, way of life, our, our, our state form. So I think uh, this side effect should be also uh, taken to the whole picture about uh, uh, when we are looking to this war in Ukraine. Of course, we should help Ukraine. It's our duty. Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians should not be uh, should not show any gratitude to us for that, for this help, because it is our duty. Uh, we are uh, acting in our interest when we are helping Ukraine. But uh, I think this moment is some kind of moment of awakening from illusions which we have after 1989, after this uh, uh, perception that the history came, to, is, is, uh, came to, to the end and there would be only uh, democracy and peace and so on. We should stand for democracy. Uh, Minister Raymond, one thing that has shifted in the last couple of decades is the perception that democracy was good at solving problems, right? Democracy worked. And I think there's been a sense more recently that some autocratic systems, without naming names here, have done a better job at solving complex problems. You now work on, on climate change. Do you see an authoritarian advantage in addressing these kinds of problems? And, and how do you see in complex, messy democracies yeah. uh, uh, any chance for progress on a, on a problem like climate change? Well, uh, we are not the only home of partisan gridlock, as you know. Uh, and uh, wash my mouth out with soap and water if I suggest that authoritarian systems are better at solving anything. They may look like they solve stuff, but certainly for uh, complex, heterogeneous uh, countries such as mine, many different ethnicities, many languages competing, uh, sort of states for resources. In that competition, the only slow, messy, unglamorous way the vulnerable get protected, and I emphasize the vulnerable because democracy speaks to the vulnerable, in my view. 
uh, uh, oligarchies do not. Uh, and at the inflection point of values and responsibility or duty, there's been some slippage globally, certainly, and I don't want to repeat my point. But uh, certainly in, in messy democracies, there are moments of great questioning. And there are in my country many times, because we have had more of an experience with authoritarian systems than democracy, and yet, the rejigging of the social contract for our federation has always come in moments of, uh, I would say, great glittering democracies. Those moments have passed because we ourselves, and you know, in democracies, we we challenge the system repeatedly, and 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 then authoritarian governments stand to get much more aid. They stand to be seen as convenient funnels for. Uh, diplomatic and other interchange. So uh, it's a complex world, but I think that for the, the messier the situation, the, the walk away from looking for the authoritarian to solve the problem is what we have to guard against. And that's, you know, the, we're in a feedback loop on, on, on uh, intellectual rigor being applied to any problem. Authoritarian states do not apply that because simply because they are not inclusive by the nature of their, you know, of that beast, mm -hmm. and and uh, building inclusion into the world we are looking to reshape, whether in Pakistan and we're in the in the thick of the the, the weeds, if you like, of the problem. It, it needs a constant reset and it needs a constant graying of the, <laughs> the hair is graying and the younger generation is asking, what did you do, what did you fight all this for? So it's like, uh, it's like being a woman in the world or in Pakistan, you know, two steps backwards, one step uh, forward or the other way around, depending I, I hope the way, other way around. how much of your glass is yeah, full yeah. today. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Senator Coons, you started getting at some of this in, in your last answer, but let's focus on the role of the United States. Sure. Um, the U.S. has seen for decades uh, part of its global mission as the promotion of democracy. That's been tarnished for lots of reasons over the last couple of year, a couple of decades. You mentioned uh, uh, Iraq and other militarized examples of democracy promotion, but all of the um, reasons to fear for our own democracy is certainly a big part of this. How do you see the U.S. as able to play any global role in advancing democracy, protecting democracy, given where we are at home? And how would you change the way we go about that, given, I think, uh, uh, new self-awareness when it comes to our own weaknesses? In a lot of ways, the, the single most important thing we can do uh, to advance democracy globally is to advance democracy domestically. Right the on. single most important thing we can do to advance democracy domestically is actually solve problems and show that whether it's reducing the cost of prescription drugs or coming up with a a bipartisan and sustainable strategy around energy security and addressing climate that we're solving problems. Um, I don't think we did enough recognizing and celebrating the very hard work of what is the largest infrastructure investment, the biggest law, the biggest uh, bipartisan um, solution set, something that's eluded Congresses and presidents for 20 years. Um, we partly took on an ambition that just kept growing and growing um, in confrontation of a wide range of problems. Um, but if we can't deliver a response to inflation, to the cost of gas, to the cost of groceries, to a sense of insecurity and instability, crime, the border, schools, your average American isn't going to vote in ways in 22 and 24 and going forward that build consensus and legitimacy and reward compromise, A, B. Um, to your point, Professor, we just sort of took for granted that democracy would grow naturally. And so the committee I chair, the subcommittee I chair, um, we invest about $60 billion a year as a nation um, in the State Department and foreign assistance. And the vast majority of that over the last 20 years has been invested in public health. We thought that by helping people in developing countries have better access to vaccines and to clean water and to health and to combat HIV AIDS and uh, malaria and tuberculosis, that this would inevitably lead towards more stable countries and indirectly, but improve our reputation and our standing. And we have underfunded partnerships around democracy significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, we just lost uh, Secretary Albright, one of the great champions of democracy who led the National Democratic Institute. I have a bill. A senator always has to say, I have a bill. <laughs> um, with Senator Lindsey Graham, an example of actually 
compromising and trying to move forward. It's a robust, bipartisan, renewed investment in democracy activity globally. We spend a very small amount of money um, on supporting civil society, on supporting right. um, protecting journalists, on supporting, um, frankly, in a digitized environment where far too many uh, governments are using um, the mechanisms of elections to facilitate surveillance and repression. Um, we have to show up. We have to be a good example ourselves. We have to show that we recognize the limitations of our own recent conduct and examples. And then we have to show up and actually partner with dozens of other countries and to the extent they welcome it, invest in the mechanisms of democracy with them. Um, Professor Snyder, I think one of the things that most of us did not recognize about um, the road to unfreedom, you know, 10 years ago, to, to <clears throat> use the title of your, your not most recent book, one of your recent books, um, was that the threat would not come in the form that many of us had thought, that a lot of the, the real challenge would come uh, electorally through people posing as Democrats who uh, uh, would represent a threat to democracy that did not, you know, look the way that it had in, in previous eras. Given the kinds of erosions of democracies that we've seen, uh, especially in electoral systems over the past 10 or 20 years. What to you does that put at the top of the priority list in terms of protecting democracy? What have we learned from, from the erosion of the past, uh, the past 10 years? Okay. Since we only have 18 minutes left, I just want to <laughs> make sure that I say the following thing, which is that democracy is wonderful. <laughs> Good. Good. Good for I'm, I'm you. Not, I'm not sure otherwise that's going to get said. Yes. Like, it, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's better than other systems. And most of our, democ our democracies would be better if they were more democratic, right? Echoing yeah. the senator, yeah. including, including my own. Like, the problem is not too, little demo too much democracy. The problem is too little democracy, mm -hmm. even in the democracies. And that, of course, leads into my answer to your question. And it goes back to what I said in the introduction, that in order to run democracies, you have to have certain kinds of principles that are acknowledged, um, among them the rule of law. And so from, you know, in, in, a, in a spectrum where, you know, Hungary is somewhere here and America is somewhere here, you see, and, and Russia is somewhere over here, you, you see that democracies can be ritualized by way of, um, of, of contaminating the mechanisms. And so you get an extreme situation as in Russia where there is no succession anymore. No one, democracy is completely fake. Or you get, you know, you're in Hungary where it's pretty much ritualized, or you're in the U.S. where we have to worry about January 6th and a repetition of January the 6th. So, but you, to get the principles right, you have to have the, the, the mechanisms right, and that seems very important to me. The, the second thing I wanted to say here, echoing another remark that um, has, has been made by, I think, all three colleagues in one form or another, we can't do any of this without the facts. We don't know anything about global warming without the facts. We don't know anything about wealth inequality without the facts. And as Minister Raymond said earlier, we, we, we spend all of our time you know, conjuring the best sound bites, but, and, and we spend all of our time thinking that we're talking about the news, but we pay, echoing now Senator Kuntz's remark, we, we pay almost no one to actually report the news. I mean, the number of actual reporters in the world is stunningly small and getting smaller all the time. And without reporters, we can't monitor the local politicians who then become the regional and the national politicians. And without the, lo without the reporters, we can't actually structure the legislation to get things done. And without the reporters, and Ukraine is just a wonderful example of this, it's thanks to the reporters in Ukraine, Ukrainian and otherwise, that we actually know what's going on, right? So my, my big answer to this is that we don't, we have to have, there are gonna be people at the top who provide spectacle. Oligarchs are always going to win if it's about spectacle. The only way to combat that is to have lots and lots of people who are actually providing facts. So investigative reporting at home and abroad. Sure. Um, I'm going to do a lightning round to all four panelists and the audience, and then I'll go to, to questions from all of you. Um, I'd like to hear all of you in, in just a few words say whether you think, if we look at a Freedom House report 10 years from now, will it show further erosion in global democracy? or gains in global democracy. Professor Snyder, I'll start with you since you're, uh, you're the one without the political risks here. <laughs> Have I already demonstrated that? Yeah. If Ukraine wins this war, yes. If Ukraine loses this war, no. Senator? Um, both. Um, a period of erosion that'll be mm -hmm. uh, more scary, more broad spread, more profound than we expect right now, and then a significant period of recovery in advance. Obviously, the outcome in Ukraine is a critical piece of that. 
Um, but in terms of response to the pandemic, to climate, and to opportunity and globalization, you could have made the argument that an authoritarian state was faster or was better at delivering a response to development and economic opportunity. I don't think you can make the argument that they delivered a better response to the pandemic, particularly with regards to innovation and the public health response, certainly with response to climate. Um, and I don't think, um, I think the example of Russia's um, brutal invasion of Ukraine is going to cause a lot of folks to reevaluate whether freedom is worth fighting for and whether freedom must be fought for. And to your point, ultimately, I believe they will conclude that it's worth fighting for. I want to speak as much as the, as long as the men do now. Fair. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> so, so, no, no, I, I don't think it's a zero sum here that if, uh, you know, one, uh, one pin drops, there'll be a domino. Um, and, and at the expense of being hugely unpopular, um, I think the outcomes are not linked to how the Ukraine fares in this. I think they are, uh, but it's not existential to the future of democracy. It's not going to pave the way in one linear you know, swoop. Uh, and secondly, I think what, it, what uh, obviously it will change the game, it will change the way the Cold War, if there is one cold and hot war, plays out. And it'll, ch and it'll shrink the resources, it'll shrink global resources uh, at a time when our attention needs to be elsewhere. And I'm not saying this because I'm Minister of Climate Change, but we are sitting in the antechamber of catastrophe, literally, of the apocalypse. And uh, we are still in the uh, in historic moment of not having the intellectual imagination or the leadership no, uh, needed to stand down to the vested interests that are holding back the real changes needed to make to the world and, and, and to, to the race to 1.5. We are well behind it and we are not going to, the vulnerable will suffer the most but so will everybody else. And this has to be a failure of our collective leadership while we put off decisions. And I'll quickly say that it's absolutely correct to say to my country or to everybody else, the, the polluters, that you need to make a transition from fossil fuels. Absolutely, we can and we should and, and set benchmarks for it. But net zero is where it is extremely far and probably unrealizable because the developed world that leapfrogged all the stages of development, and so it should, is still emitting. And, and one country that shall remain unnamed lecturing in a, in, a, in a meeting about transiting is actually reconsidering because of their national needs. So it can't be this way. You know, big chem, big oil, big petroleum has to be faced. They have to be socially responsible and that can only be driven from forums like this. These are intrinsic to that conversation. I'm going to give you a 15-second two-finger. As a man who only said six words. <laughs> you, you, were, you were good. Um, I'm just going to add, one of the reasons I think Russia has to lose is that the Russian state is a hydrocarbon oligarchy. And this war is a sample of what the 21st yes. century will look like yes. if the hydrocarbon oligarchs get to win. Yes. Mr. President? Yeah. Uh, this... Uh, War is a war of an autocratic regime against a democratic state. And this is not only a war between two states, but also between two systems, two uh, kind of state uh, forms. And I would say that uh, democracy on long term uh, has better chances and there could be some declines, but, uh, but, in, uh, for, uh, but in long term, better chances for two reasons. The first reason is that democracy is much more attractive to the people as each form of autocracy. There is uh, no very attractive system in the West, for example, the Chinese system. It's very little uh, number of persons which mm. wanted to have this Chinese system by us, for example. But vice versa, it is. It is really uh, a part of population in autocratic uh, regimes want to have democracy. And it is a very important um, uh, mechanism of, of uh, democracy that uh, this attractiveness. 
The second is, democracy is uh, not immune against false decisions and against illusions. And we can speak, speak about the illusions that uh, what you said already that uh, democracy has won for, the, for eternity and so on. Mm -hmm. It was an illusion. But democracy is the only form of government, of, of state, uh, which has a mechanism of self, uh, um, uh, of, uh, which can correct the, uh, the own decisions. Autocracies cannot correct. This is, they would be, they will fail. But uh, democracy is a system uh, where the corrective mechanism is included, and that means this, that means despite the failures, at the end, this failure uh, is normally corrected. And this, uh, for this reason, uh, democracy is stronger as each form of autocracy. And therefore, I am after 10 years, optimist. optimistic. Same and question. Including to that uh, Rush, Russia uh, will lose this war and Ukraine will win. Same question to the audience, but only yes or no, and you're all required to answer. Hands up if you're optimistic about democracy in 10 years. <laughs> Pessimistic? OK, optimistic crowd. Uh, questions, I think the first one was in the front row here. Sorry, second row here. And please identify yourself when asking a question and keep it, keep it short so we can get as many in as possible. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this conversation. Um, I'm the chair of the Green Party in Israel and a former member of parliament. And I think it's clear for all of us that democracy depends on ongoing work and collaboration. However, while we see populists collaborating globally very efficiently, building infrastructure together, using the same words, the same vocabulary, the same rhetoric, helping each other, I don't see those who believe in, de in democratic values operating in sync in the same way. And my question to you is, what do you think we can do to increase democratic collaboration internationally in order to save our democracies that are in trouble? Do you want to direct trouble? it to any, any one panelist? Um, All of you. Mr. President, do you want to take yeah. this one? So uh, I think uh, we have now realized that uh, democracy is fragile. And after this uh, new um, information, which we have now after this uh, war or during this war, uh, there, uh, this is an incentive to collaborate more between democracies. And uh, you, Senator, said already that uh, until now, uh, United States aid uh, was not directed to, to, uh, to strengthen democracy. I assume that it would be now more in this direction. Uh, yeah. So uh, we know all that uh, democracy is a state form which uh, guarantees in long term uh, the better results. And therefore, I think that we are also uh, now aware that we should more collaborate. I said already this uh, was that demo democracies should be more visible in international politics. Uh, uh, this uh, conference uh, of democracies uh, organized by President Biden, I think it is a very good uh, point, and uh, I assume that this year it would be the next conference. Yes. I think we should have a sense uh, of this 60 to 90 states in the world that we belong to one system which is based on the same values. And uh, if we will strengthen this uh, uh, feeling of belonging to the same system, of course, it would also uh, uh, strengthen the democracy in the world. Any 15-second uh, add just, on to that? I'll just briefly say we invest fairly heavily in legislative exchanges, and there are lots of conferences and travel and meetings, but not enough. Uh, we can and should be doing a lot more uh, to help parliamentarians from, to your point, Mr. President, democracies around the world, both those that are struggling and those that have a lot to learn from each other and those that seem better established. Um, I think we had taken for granted that we had a lot uh, positive to teach. Now I think we need to recognize we also have a lot to learn. But exactly those exchanges I'm intending to strengthen our investment uh, in doing for them. I, I just want to speak to, I think, I think the connections are crucial in terms of both learnings and support. But democracies are inherently um, not linear in their experience. And people and different countries experience or navigate democracy 
quite differently from each other. No one size fits all. So I think we need to move away from the notion that there is one set pattern for democracy or, or, or that parliaments uh, all work one way. The point is having tolerance for the models we all favor as long as they are representative and inclusive. I think that's what matters. May I say one word? Let me, let me get uh, Professor Snyder in first, one second. Okay, young, young, pe younger people have to try to make democracy cool. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to put that on you. And number two, although I completely take the point about, about the pluralism of democratic forms, the way that the bad guys try to game the systems tend to be quite similar. And so one thing I think is that, that parties should, should be looking for across national lines should be looking for other parties to talk to, not only on ideological lines. So I'm sure you have you know, friends who are Greens in Germany and Austria and so on. But the parties who care about democracy are not necessarily the parties that have the same outward ideological profile. So for example, Viktor Orban's party right, was in with the center right in the European Parliament for a very long time, which caused a lot of difficulty because of a superficial ideological profile. But, it's, but parties that are actually in favor of democracy and who need to trade um, experience about how to hold back the people who are gaming the system, they should be talking to each other. Let me go to the um, uh, second row here. Um, thanks, Ken Roth from Human Rights Watch. There seems to be a certain schizophrenia in this conversation. It started out very pessimistic and is now turning more optimistic. Um, and I, I take the point that you know, democracy is facing serious autocratic challenge. It's not delivering. But when I look out there, I actually, you know, if you put yourself in an autocrat's shoes, I see a pretty hostile world. You know, there have been these big you know, pro-democracy, anti-autocrat demonstrations really across the world, you know, Hong Kong, Thailand, um, Myanmar, Russia, Belarus, Uganda, Sudan, Cuba, Nicaragua. I mean, it's pretty pervasive. Um, you know, second, we talk about you know, autocrats learning how to manipulate the system, but they're actually getting less good at it because they're resorting to this you know, extreme versions where they disqualify all the opposition candidates or shut down all the media. And so they have an electoral charade, but they don't get any legitimacy from it. And then you know, there is this tendency of um, learning how to band together. You know, so you see these kind of anti-autocratic coalitions that even emerged in, it didn't work in Hungary, but it did work in Czech Republic. It, you know, Erdogan's facing in Turkey, it worked in Israel, it worked with Biden. You know, and so I just, when I look there, I, I see something that's kind of um, you know, more optimistic than, than at least what was initially described. Am I, am I missing something or, or what do you think? L let me give each of you 30 seconds uh, to, oh. to, 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 to wrap up because <laughs> oh, we're, at, we're at, two, we're at, two, we're at two, two minutes left. So, <laughs> Minister, why don't, why don't we start with no, you? No, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying that, look, I'm reeling at the, at the framing of everything, of, of the lifeline or lifetime or span or breadth of democracy as a Ukraine or not Ukraine victory uh, conversation. I'll be very honest. Uh, the, the a mea culpa on Afghanistan or Iraq might help bridge that gap for me uh, and many others from my part of the world. Uh, but we are still seeing democracy as the only ultimate uh, way of, of life and governance, if you like. That's the only social contract that includes people and speaks to complex, uh, you know, complex federations and states. Uh, building, uh, you know, having legitimacy is crucial to that. And that's the, that's the gap that we are all having with each other or seeing with each other e within country and even without. I think that needs to come back. And we need to also be very clear about speaking the language that uh, otherizes the non-democrat, which is right now, I don't want to be free and easy with words. They matter. But the F word is back, isn't it? The fascism word, not the other one. <laughs> but the, the F word is back in our lexicon. We're seeing it uh, everywhere uh, in different variation and, and molds. And it's, it's authoritarianism is, is, is tilting very hard. It's taking a hard right towards that dark moment of shame we don't want to speak about collectively, which is fascism. And it's coming back. Professor Snyder, let me go to you since you just wrote a piece called Russia is Fascist. Uh, 
your, your uh, uh, response to uh, Ken Roth's question. Well, uh, first of all, I wanted to give you a mea culpa for Iraq, Afghanistan, and I'll throw in Syria, too. Thank you. I yes, mean, Syria. I, I was, I was yeah. against Iraq 20 years ago, and I've been, you know, it was, it was the, one of the most harmful, not to mention stupid things, done geopolitically in the 21st century. So I'm happy to give you those mea culpas if that helps. Right. And one of the reasons, again, why I'm against the Russian invasion of Ukraine is that I think it ought to be understood as, an, imp as an imperial war mm -hmm. and in a larger framework of the history of European colonialism that makes a lot of the language easier to understand and the war easier to understand. And I think it gives Americans a good reason to think back directly on Syria and the mistakes we, I believe we made in Syria. Um, what was I supposed to be talking about, though? We, 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 uh, That's wonderful. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you buy the optimism that uh, the optimistic case? I that... So I'm a historian, so I think that the, the possibilities are always broader than we think, both negative and positive. And we, 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 might, we might disagree about Ukraine, but I think we're at a hinge where things can go off in a lot of different directions depending upon good or bad decisions we make in the next, in the next few months and years. Senator Coons. Ken, um, you cited the, the optimism that, for example, the peaceful revolution in Sudan brought. Um, I am also struggling through the um, grim reality of the moment of a military coup and a return to a militarized government. Yeah. But I take your point that across the world, across dozens of cultures, millions and millions of people want to have a hand in determining their own future. Um, I think democracy is the best form um, of structuring society in the best way to make sure, as you put it, that the vulnerable are included and accounted for, that one has a self-correcting mechanism, that we have any hope of addressing existential challenges like um, climate change. Um, but it's also something we are going to have to fight for. Um, and I thought I delivered the mea culpa before, but oh, I'll reinforce it. Thank you. The United States <laughs> needs to recognize that we need some humility. Um, every year we play a World Series in which only Americans compete. Um, <laughs> perhaps that suggests to us that maybe we need a rebranding oh. and a reexamination of who we are and our place in the world. We have a lot to learn. Part of why I come to Davos is to hear from and learn from uh, folks from very different cultures and countries and backgrounds. But that's also the point um, of our trying to learn from each other across the world. I remain optimistic about democracy. Mr. President, the last words to you. Yes, I am also optimistic uh, because, um, of course, in the last uh, decades, or in the last decade, uh, there is a decay of democracy because of the failures of democracy, of the failures of perception of the world, of a perception of reality. But, as I already said, democracy is the only state form which includes also the mechanism of self-correcting. And we are now here also uh, using this mechanism of self-correcting by this self-reflection. Self-reflection is also a characteristic only for democracies. Yeah, yeah. And we are doing so. So we are correcting our failure, failures. And then if we would uh, correct these failures, then of course I am optimistic. Well, we will stop there before we turn pessimistic again. <laughs> Please give all of our panelists a huge thank you.